Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure CES. Uh, we are studying the book of Philippians. We are in chapter three, and we'll begin with verse 18. So get your Bibles ready, and we'll start in just a second. So you want to say hello to the congregation, Renee? Hey there, beloved saints. Good to see you guys tonight. Uh, welcome to, oh, sorry, I have to fix it. Uh, for any of the new people that are here, welcome. And thank you, mods. And welcome back, uh, returning visitors. Happy to have you here. Yes, welcome to you if it's your first time. Okay, Brother Ben, you want to greet the congregation? Yes, hello everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm just going to be producing tonight, but I'm going to be uh, listening intently. So, looking forward to the study. Okay, let's see. Uh, looks like we've got uh, plenty of people ready to go. So, uh, I'm going to try to focus on the uh, the study rather than the chat room. But if you do need to make a comment, or if you put it in all caps, maybe we it can be brought to our attention if we need to. Uh, uh, respond to you if you have something relevant to the study. Uh, all right, let's, let's just begin then. Let's, uh, Renee, I'll, uh, I'll take turns reading with you back and forth here. Uh, verse 18, I'll read to you and the KJV. It says, uh, uh, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Renee? I want to say here, a lot of people hear the word walk and they automatically think of works, right? But I believe that Paul is referring to his earlier about walking according to these things, right? So let's go forward. He said, you know, uh, I'm not perfect yet, but I strive. Uh, in addition, he said uh, that he was of the stock of Israel. Uh, if they want to glory in their flesh, he could glory even more if he wanted to. But he counted all the things he gained through the law uh, to be dung or worthless, whatever status, whatever he thought he might have. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man think he has whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. And so he says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Uh, and he says, I do count them, but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformed into his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And then he starts talking about, he's not being morbid, he's speaking about his actual death here, that he will not be perfect until he attains the actual resurrection, but he would like to attain unto it. He would like to walk in the power of the resurrection in his life now. But he says, and those guys, wherever you are basically, uh, mind this same thing, be followers together of me. So you should all have this same mind in you that the law, you don't glory in your flesh. You don't have confidence in the flesh. You don't have confidence in you, in the law or circumcision or any such thing. But the power of our walk comes from resting in the righteousness of God in Christ. Right. And so he says here, I have not obtained perfection, not as though I had already attained either. We're already perfect. And so he's saying, you guys, listen to me, think like I do, walk like I do with this in mind. Now, so when we look at the context of this, this is not talking about walking as in keeping the strict law and living right. It's about walking with the mind of Christ having the thought that we don't rely on our own righteousness, but we draw on the power of his resurrection 
by faith in Jesus. And so that will give us the strength to be perfected or matured in our walk. We'll never be perfect in this flesh. And so when Paul says, right before this verse, he says, brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. So look at me and look at followers of me and followers of Christ and use them as your example. Those that have this mind, not the law mind. Okay. Uh, and we should uh, be living in the power of the resurrection in this life now, drawing on the power that the Holy Spirit gives us by his grace through faith and with no confidence in our flesh. Now, with that being said, he says, for many walk, because he asked them, mark them which walk so as you have us for an example, right? For many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, what is the context here? Go above. It's always those that are legalists. What does he beware? What does he tell you to beware of in the beginning of this chapter? Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of concision, which is a, a slang for the circumcision. So beware of those who come in pretending that they're apostles of Jesus, but really they're just religious Pharisees that want to bring you into bondage. Have you have confidence in your flesh instead of drawing on the power that comes from resting in Christ and his resurrection, right? Because we don't begin in grace to be saved and then go back to legalism for the power of our walk. We remain in grace and, and remain in Christ. For that power as well. And so when he says many walk opposite that, he's saying these legalists that try to get you to take your eyes off of Jesus and the power of his resurrection and onto something you're doing, they are enemies of the cross. Why? Because they minimize what the cross accomplished and they minimize the power that. Uh, being in his grace and the Holy Spirit gives us. Because what do they do still today, you guys? They will say, oh, you just love sin. You're antinomian, right? Because they deny the power of the Holy Spirit. They deny that God will chastise his kids when they get disobedient uh, uh, because he wants to protect us. And, and my rod and my staff comforts us, right? It's to guide us. So it's the same mindset today. So beware of dogs, unbelievers, evil workers, workers of iniquity, those that think you're saved by works, and the concision or the circumcision. All legalists that deny the efficiency and sufficiency of the cross. So if they're walking by that, they're enemies of the cross. That That's the context here. A lot of people will say, for many walk of who I've told you often, even weeping that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. See, they were walking. They were living in sin. This has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what they're trusting in and trying to get you to trust in, right? They're enemies of the cross because they speak against what the cross has accomplished. So the walk there is not just that they're legalists and try to get your mind off of it, but that they're trying to get you to see that resting in God's righteousness by faith is not sufficient to empower you to walk worthily either. And so those people walk uh, in a way that it, they're, they're actually enemies of the cross of Christ. They work against the truth of the gospel and uh, try to put you back in bondage. So that's the context of what he's warning them about, clearly. Hmm. Well, amen. That's uh, That was wonderful. He connected all the dots and gave us the right context. Um, well, I don't want to vary uh, too much off uh, 
into a tangent, but let, let me just read those verses first in the uh, Amplified. Uh, I'm going to read 17 first and 18. It says, brothers and sisters, together follow my example and observe those who live by the pattern we gave you. For there are many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, who live as enemies of the cross of Christ, rejecting and opposing his way of salvation. So I think that the Amplify uh, amplified it in the way that is in complete agreement with everything Renee said. Uh, but so I, I, I don't need to say more. I can't say it any better. But uh, let me uh, talk about a couple of problems. When when Paul talks about, uh, oh, let me read it in the KJV, it's more obvious. Uh, um, in verse 17, he says, Brethren, be followers together of me. I know I mentioned this last time, but uh, this is a verse that the, um, the hyper-dispensationalists use to um, uh, elevate Paul. Uh, this is, and I don't want to give anybody the impression that I, I'm anti-Paul in any way. Uh, I certainly, uh, I'll elevate Paul to a, a certain extent. Uh, I will give him a, 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 a special distinction. He, he's the one that is responsible for clarifying the, that we're not only saved by faith in Jesus and his accomplishment, his promise for us, but you better not mix any works with it or you've ruined it. The, he, that's, that's his primary mission, I think, to make sure that you don't mix it with works and turn it into faith, uh, faith in Jesus and dividing your faith also in religion, particularly Judaism. So uh, this is where Paul makes this great contribution that is so important to the church. Uh, but the hyper-dispensationalists, uh, unfortunately, even though I think we all agree that Paul had this very special message to make that one point clear to everybody, don't add your works to it. It's faith alone. Uh, but the hyper uh, that's not enough for them. They got to elevate him even higher so that you cannot be saved except by Paul's words. You can't be saved by anything in the Bible that was not written by Paul. I mean, I could go on and on. Hyper-dispensationalism is, uh, I call it Paul-onlyism, because they, they take Paul, set him aside, and said he is the only one for us. Forget uh, John and Peter, anybody else, even Jesus, even Jesus' own words, the red letters in the Bible, that's not really to us, that's just to Israel. So they really make a big mistake by separating Paul, saying he's our apostle, and that's why this verse here is of special interest to me. When he, Paul says, be followers of me, they take that and run with it. Uh, now, there is a, a point uh, uh, in C Corinthians where um, the, there's another problem, and, and that is that uh, Paul says, some say that they are of Paul. Uh, some say they're of um, Cephas, uh, Peter. Some say they're of Apollos. So he sees this problem arising that people are identifying themselves too much with one of the apostles and dividing into already into denominations, following a, a particular apostle or teacher. Uh, and uh, so he wants to put an end to that. And that should be a warning to the hyper-dispensationalists. We're not supposed to identify with a, an apostle uh, just like it's wrong to identify with Martin Luther. I'm a Lutheran. Uh, John Calvin, I'm a Calvinist. Why are you identifying with men? Our identity is in Christ. I am a Christian. So uh, it's very important that we uh, uh, don't let the hyperdes take these verses and uh, and use it to, to twist their, their into that horrible doctrine. But um, as far as what the in intended meaning of these verse, verses are, uh, Rene really got it right, and Amplified really got it right, too. Okay, Rene, why don't you uh, read the next verse uh, for me? All righty. Whose end is destruction, 
whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. I had, to, I had to click so many things to try to get back to this screen and unmute again. <laughs> I think I'll just stop muting tonight here right, so I can make it simple. Uh, well, yeah, that's just a following up, uh, further uh, making the point that uh, uh, these people he's referring to that have this particular walk, it's not the walk of righteousness. Uh, it's not being, uh, it's it's the walk of, uh, of saying that, uh, the gospel to Paul teaches is a false gospel. Paul's a false apostle. Uh, those people who are teaching that and those people who are embracing that, that's who he's referring to. And he goes on to say, these people whose end is destruction. So let me read verse 19 in the Amplified and see if it helps at all. It says, whose fate is destruction. So fate is destruction, obviously. That, that if you have a false gospel, you're not saved. Unless you're like the Galatians, that you believe the gospel, and then the false teachers led you astray, and you went into apostasy, and Paul has to try to get you back on track. But you are already brethren. You already got the Holy Spirit. You were already regenerated, according to everything we studied in Galatians. Um, so, um, but that Paul is saying with these people, no, their their fate is destruction. They never did get saved. They've been they were Jews who now they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in Jesus for salvation. They believe it's Jesus and practicing Judaism that saves you. So they never got the gospel right. So they are their fate is destruction. Whose God is their belly, their worldly appetite, their sensuality, their vanity, and whose glory is in the shame, and who focus their mind on earthly and temporal things. So uh, I, I, would, I would relate that more to, to uh, their, their belly and their desire is practicing their religion and showing like the, basically it's being a Pharisee. Um, okay, Renee, well, let's hear you. Yeah, I, 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 I am very upset here because although I do believe there are places uh, where it is horrible and upsets Paul, that Christians are being carnal and living horribly sinful lives, like the Corinthians with fornication commonly reported and stuff. I do not believe this, what this verse is talking about. And I don't know why the whole chapter is about how we have God's righteousness, beware of dogs and, and circumcision and all the legalists. And then all of a sudden they're going to go back to, those that walk are actually those that sin a lot and give Jesus the bad name. Because here's an example. I looked it up to see if there were people that have a commentary that support what the most people think it means. And he does. And it's surprising to me. It says the enemy of the cross were the opposite of the legalists who celebrate their supposed liberty to indulge their flesh. And that as long as your soul was saved, it didn't matter what you did with your body. I don't see that anywhere in this chapter. I see him inspiring people to walk uh, uh, like a Christian should walk, but to draw that power from his resurrection, not legalism, right? Uh, so now the context could include that they're lascivious, but here's the thing. The word here, Luke, that, that comes to me is who mind earthly things, okay? Those which are of the flesh mind the things of the flesh. Doesn't he say that in Romans? What's the context there? They focus on circumcision. They're focusing on hand washing, things done in the flesh. They don't eat this, don't eat that. Things of the flesh, right? Things of the flesh are not always uh, things that we would consider sinful, fornication and that kind of thing, right? So sometimes things of the flesh, minding things of the flesh or minding earthly things 
It could be worrying about, like it, it talked about, uh, the false humility, voluntary humility, worshiping of angels, uh, circumcision. Why would he warn about legalists at the beginning of the chapter and then at the end start talking about those that don't follow the law? And those are the ones you got to worry about. To me, when it says when they don't walk the way he says, it's because they're trying to impose legalism upon the congregation. In addition, they could be uh, lascivious and just look righteous on the outside, like religious hypocrites. That's possible. But I just don't see this context here where he claims these people just think because you're saved anyway, it doesn't matter what you do in your body. I don't see that here in any of the context, but it is, you could apply this. I want to be clear. You could apply that to someone that would walk in a way that would shame the name of Jesus. For instance, hey, I'm a Christian, but you're dishonest. You are a womanizer. You're an adulterer. That would be an enemy of the cross in the sense that it is causing evil to be spoken of the church and is causing harm to come to the name of Jesus. So that would be an enemy of the cross. But to me here, it's talking, it's warning about the circumcision. Why would we go from warning people about legalist to now warning people that there are those that claim to be Christian that just love to sin? I, I don't, I just don't see uh, all of that here. I, I think it's just weird that we would change the entire context of the chapter and take this one verse and think it's saying that. Uh, I think it could include people that didn't walk after Paul and uh, mature elders in the church. They, If they don't walk like Paul and the mature elders, sure, they could be lascivious, fleshly, carnal people, and that could be enemies of the cross, sure. But the warning here is not really about that, is it? It, it's about those that glory in their flesh and want you to glory in it. And Paul saying, we want to walk in the power of his resurrection and become mature and strive for perfection, although we won't in, until we're in our glorified body, but it doesn't uh, keep us from striving for it, but that we don't have our own righteousness in order to achieve that. We, we walk in the power of his resurrection to achieve that, not by legalism. So I don't know how it's possible that he would be jumping back and forth to say that whose end is destruction. So they're not saved clearly, as you pointed out, whose God is their belly. Okay. Yeah. They're uh, a lot of times there's a God is their belly. They, they want some kind of gain, um, uh, earthly gain. Uh, a lot of times it's financial um, and whose glory is in their shame, is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So to me, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things, is the fact that they're glorying in the wrong thing, uh, circumcision. And I, I just, I, I just think they're minding earthly things. They're legalist and the specific thing here is the circumcision because it warns about they want you to glory in your flesh so although it says you know many walk it could include that since he is talking about follow those you know him and others like him that are maturing in their faith that that strive for a godly life but the whole point of this chapter is to beware of these legalists that appear like they know what they're talking about because they seem all religious and they're Jews. A lot of them would say, hey, we're the real children of Abraham. And they would trick these Gentiles into thinking that they were more qualified than Paul and they would undo Paul's teaching and all that kind of stuff. So 
to me, it could include it. Do you guys get what I'm saying there, Luke? It could include it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm following you. I'm following. You. I agree. I, but uh, the um, this is happening around probably 55 A.D. And uh, when we see that the, there's a record in the epistles and Paul's epistles of the the thorn in his flesh, the the Judaizers the people who are, are basically Pharisees who get converted and believe in Jesus, but they they never either learned or accepted that they have to believe in Jesus, not Judaism any longer. And so they're trying to impose that on everybody. That, and, and what they're, so they're really Pharisees. Well, this idea is, is clear throughout the, uh, the New Testament. Uh, but even after that, when you get into church history, into the, the second century, um, that that that's very very clear that the idea of being saved by faith alone is pretty much just discarded, and and right in the second century you can see the second and third generation of church leaders they start embracing uh, baptismal regeneration, uh, the Eucharist sacrament, and pretty much it evolves by uh, uh, the next few hundred years into officially Roman Catholicism. But Judaism and Jesus is basically what when he compared it quite well to uh, uh, Roman Catholicism. Uh, Roman Catholicism kind of caught, tries to copy. They have uh, it's very ritualistic, like Judaism. You know, they have all the clothing and the the, the costuming and the, uh, the 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 uh, the appearance like the priests of, of in Judaism. Uh, and and so basically, um, Roman Catholicism and um, uh, Christian religion is taking uh, ideas from Roman, uh, from uh, Judaism, the legalism, the rituals, the, the traditions, and trying to keep that. And, and, and even now, so many Roman Catholics, what they do is they, they are in love with the ceremony of, of the mass. And, you know, if you look at the beautiful cathedral, all, all the gold and the, the stained glass windows and the incense. I mean, it, a person can get just can totally uh, overwhelmed by the, 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 like the, the beauty and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the ritual of it is just very in intoxicating to people. Even some people who leave uh, want to leave, they believe correctly now, but they still want to stay because they, they don't want to give up that ritual. Well, that's what that's what the tr church was in the beginning, and throughout all history to today, it's remained. There's, it's almost all professing Christians throughout history have never ever gotten understood what Paul said that you have to leave the religion out of it. Christianity is not a religion; it's not a a system of legalistic system of things of do's and don'ts and rituals and sacraments and, and a way of trying to make yourself acceptable to God. You need to put no faith in that. Your faith has to be entirely in the person, the accomplishment and the promise of Jesus Christ alone. Uh, but how many people back then, throughout history and now, believe as we do? This much, this much of professing Christians Maybe 10% of professing Christians believe in grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. So that's really what the people are talking about. And I, I, when he talks about the verse that you were focusing on, Renee, uh, let me see, it says, um, uh, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Uh, what came to my mind was, was when Jesus talked to the Pharisees about your, your whitewashed tombs, but you're full of dead man's bones. The earthly things are the out, outward appearances. Well, what a beautiful tomb it is. It's white, white and pure, and a picture of, of purity and, and holiness. But inside, it's really shameful because it's just religious self-righteousness. So I, I, I agree with your point. And, uh, but it's not new, Renee. It, it's, a, it's been a problem from the beginning. It'll persist until the end of history. I want to answer Mike saying I'm confusing him because I'm going back and forth. Is it about sin or is it about legalism? Well, I think the context is clear. It's warning about these legalists, the circumcision, the dogs, the evil workers, right? 
and that we should begin as we intend to go on in the grace and the righteousness of God by faith. But I was pointing out that many people think this verse refers to sin, how a Christian is living, meaning earthly things, God is their belly, means they're really sinful, lascivious. I, I, I don't see that in the context. Uh, whose God is their belly and mind earthly things, what I think of is, well, one, financial uh, gain and power, just like the religious leaders of the day. They didn't want their the temple to be over and Jesus to let people directly come to the throne of grace. They want it to be the intercessor and control people. And uh, the beginning of the chapter is warning people about these legalists those that worry about circumcision. So earthly things and uh, Christiany also pointed out God is their belly. I thought of the food laws too, uh, Christiany. I was like, uh, they're so mindful of things of the earth, of things of the flesh. Um, and I, I think that's why Paul's reminding us about heavenly things here. So although I do believe you could use this verse, to say, you know, those that claim to be church leaders that live as adulterers behind the scenes or have some big scandal and end up being horrible sinners like this thing with Ravi Zacharias, which strangely enough, he was a lordship teacher, not free grace. But uh, we always find out these guys have, they are usually have some kind of sexual issue, right? So they, they harm uh, the church. But and I guess in a way they could be enemies of the cross of Christ because it brings damage to the church. To me, though, the context here is when they focused on earthly things like circumcision and things of the flesh, they are enemies of the cross and that they're denying what was accomplished by Christ. So um, the reason I, I don't know why you'd be confused, Mike. I'm sorry you were, but I clearly said. Here's what the commentary was saying. I don't know how they got that from this because I see the warning against the circumcision, against the legalists, the dogs, the evil workers, unbelievers who are clearly lost. And they call he calls them the concision, which is a slang, a derogatory slang for mutilated or circumcised in this case. So what do the circumcision do? They enforce their legalism. And mind earthly things, food laws, circumcision, baptisms, washing of hands, rituals, certain things like that. So um, that is why we were discussing both, because I see a lot of people take that verse to mean just sin in general, which it could be applied. Let's say anybody that's living lasciviously and claims Christ is an enemy of the cross in the sense it's harming the church, right? But legalists that come in and tell people not to trust in Christ or God's righteousness by faith in Jesus, but to trust their own righteousness of the law is certainly an enemy of the cross. So I think it's clearly a warning against uh, uh, Judaizers. Yeah, I don't think you're confusing at all. And uh, the com the commentary that you referred to I thought it was interesting, the point that they were making in the commentary, which I, I think is the wrong <laughs> position, but they were making the point that we hear so often where the, the legalists, uh, they want to take a verse and try to uh, make it uh, point at us as we are, well, we, we're not, we're antinomian. We don't care about sin and we don't, we're giving people a license to sin. Uh, that's the way that, uh, 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 well, I was getting from your reading from the commentary. Yeah, yeah, like like these people, but but nothing in there supports that, Luke. That no. they thought, oh, because we're saved anyway, it doesn't matter what we do. So we're just gonna. I don't see anything in this chapter yeah. referring to people that take that position. Yeah. Plus, you 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 mentioned over and over again the circumcision, and really that is the key. I think that you have to remember that th this is what it's talking about: the people who are saying uh, you got to get circumcised. Acts fifteen verse one: you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. And then uh, and further, they they go to Paul's churches and say, oh, uh, 
you you got to follow keep the Sabbath. Oh, you got to keep the all laws of Moses. And then finally in Hebrews, you got to do animal sacrifices and all that. So they're they're really uh, everything in Judaism. Uh, uh, they're trying to continue, but really the the nice thing is that uh, uh, you know I've been doing all this study of um, eschatology again, and uh, I'm really enjoying it. But uh, since my, based on the conclusions uh, I have now. I'm saying, well, wow, it's, it's a darn good thing that uh, the uh, the temple in 70 AD was destroyed because by destroying the temple, Judaism came to an end. Uh, there has no been no Judaism practiced in the world since the destruction of the temple. You can't practice Judaism without the temple and the animal sacrifices. So the, the best they could do is uh, all the things that are, you know, uh, apart from that but it's it's incomplete it's not really judaism without it so that put an end to judaism really and so uh but uh they were trying back then to you know hey we we are jews and that believe in jesus and so we and if you're not a jew you gotta get circumcised become a jew and now believe in jesus so they they just love their religion and they wanted to keep it and they are still they still uh even people who are Legalists and the uh, uh, the lordship uh, heretics today uh, they don't even realize it, but they're all they're doing is uh, the same thing. They're being Judaizers, saying that whether you want to call it Judaism or just call it legalism, that they they uh, they want to won't let go of that. They will not just say it's Christ alone. They got to say he, Christ is not enough. You got to be you know practice all the laws of Moses too. Let me read these last two verses together for you, Renee. Uh, it's, uh, it says uh, 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Wow. Yeah, you know, this is why I think our position is correct. Because he mentioned these people. He starts a chapter out uh, saying, Be beware of these people, right? These legalists. Then he goes on to say, now, walk as I walk. I desire to be perfect to walk in the power of his resurrection. I haven't attained it yet, and I won't until I'm literally dead and in the resurrection, but I'm going to strive for that, right? And you guys should too, be followers of me. Then he says, you know, there's guys that mind these earthly things, and they're enemies of the cross, whose God is their belly, and they mind earthly things, right? So what does he do right after saying that? whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven. So they're minding earthly things like circumcision, worried about their flesh, but this body's going to be changed. What, what does it matter if we put a cut in our body when it's not our permanent body? It's, it's corruption. It needs to, to put on incorruption. So it, they're focused on this thing here, this earthly thing, things of the flesh, uh, yet God's going to change this vile body. So it's not a permanent thing. Circumcision is not a permanent thing. Spiritual rebirth is, right? For our conversation is in heaven, not in earthly things. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. So the promise here, the focus should be on his what? Let's go up. The power of his resurrection. Because we're going to have that glorified body just like him. He'll change our vile body, that it may be fashioned unto his glorious body. So we go right back to why are we worried about earthly things like circumcision and focusing on earthly stuff when our conversation is in heaven, we're looking towards him and he's going to change our vile body. It's going to be likened to his glorious body. So we're going to focus again 
on the power of his resurrection. So uh, I think it just brings it all back around to being focused on what Jesus did and walking in God's righteousness by faith and not our own. Because again, people have pointed out, I think Victoria did point it out, the strength of sin is not grace. The strength of sin is the law. So I think it goes hand in hand. And I think you'll see these legalists or lordshippers, you'll find out they have all these hidden, they look good for a while, but it comes out maybe after their death, but they had done, they did something, some lascivious, like they were dishonest, they stole money, they ripped people off, they were adulterers, they harassed women, whatever. It's usually strengthening the sin. The legalism strengthens the sin. So I think they do go hand in hand, actually. Yeah, well, you know, you mentioned Ravi Zacharias and, um, you know, um, we have, uh, I think it's, I forget what it's called, RV, no, R, RZM, like R Ravi Zacharias Ministry or something. It's one of the channels that we have. RZM. Yeah. Uh, yeah, International Ministries, what it is. Uh, but it, it, we have uh, 10 channels that we have listed as channels that we recommend that are, you know, very good teaching that, we, I think that would be very beneficial. Um, I don't know. I haven't learned that much about it, but just a little bit I know now. I'm going to have to rethink that and and uh, consider uh, that channel of, as recommending it because uh, what's coming out about Ravi Zacharias now. Uh, He's I need still to work. a good apologist. He's still a good apologist. It helps a lot well, of atheists. Yeah, his, his his apologist work is there's nobody better. No. Uh, and uh but you know it i never really dawned on me before until you were talking about his, his lordship i you know what i didn't know that because i i don't ever remember him even uh preaching the gospel because he he focused so much just on apologetics answering people's yeah. objections to well he's the, not against free grace or anything i think he was saved i clearly think the man was saved i think he was a, a victim of hero worship and because of his position, nobody, he was just like a celebrity. Nobody would question him. Yeah. And he felt that he couldn't come to anybody with it because of the burden of the ministry. He felt it would have harmed the ministry. So he got deeper and deeper into sin and covering it up. And, and it's hero worship. And he, did, I really think he didn't have anybody to go to. And that's, I'm not making an excuse for him. I'm just telling him, I know how celebrities can get into these situations and they live double lives. They just live double lives. It doesn't mean he wasn't saved. Uh, I'm not here to judge my salvation, but you can see what a great, you just mentioned it, Brother Luke, great apologist. Really, really answer some great questions. So what happens is his behavior now has destroyed all that work. And so now somebody that may have looked up to him and believed what he was saying, now they're always oh, just another hypocrite and it ends up damaging the cause for Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's really sad, but just because somebody is uh, not living as a carnal Christian or has some terrible sin, it does not mean that they're not saved or that they did everything they said wasn't right. He said a lot of right things just because somebody is flawed. Doesn't mean they, they, they what everything they're saying is false. You know, mm -hmm. so we, we've got to be realistic. These are just people and we shouldn't elevate these people, these church leaders into some kind of status to where they're inhuman and, think they get, they're perfect because they're not. And then we're crushed when we find out they're just sinners like everybody else. Yeah. You know? That's true. Uh, I mean, obviously, if if I was going to uh, just confess right now to everybody uh, any secret things that I, I have that I'm it would embarrass me or that I'm ashamed of in my life, uh, even after I got saved. But, uh, you know, obviously, I'm 
I'm not uh, without any sin myself, but is what is hard for me to understand about him and, and some of the others that are famous is that uh, I understand as, uh, impulsive things uh, because uh, let's say that uh, uh, you have a, a, a reaction and it's, uh, uh, I don't know how better to say it, except it's, it's, it's impulsive. But to me, it's a lot different than some doing a sin that's uh, uh, thought out, carefully planned and plotted. And then, I mean, in other words, someone said uh, that uh, in, in uh, some uh, adultery, that while we couldn't help it, it, it just happened. We, we just fell in love and it just happened. And uh, well, when it comes to, let's say, sexual intercourse, uh, nobody just like slips on a banana peel, falls down and discovers that they are in a sexual position with someone. That it, it doesn't happen that way. And it, uh, there are, there's a whole bunch of doors that have to be walked through from uh, you know, a flirtatious moment and then a, let's say a, a, a conversation that is, is uh, you know, uh, continues the flirt, flirtation and then plans. And then, all, in other words, all these steps have to lead up to this. And so that's what is hard for me to understand um, with these, some of these famous people, because it's not like they, they just had an impulsive moment and just uh, made a big mistake. Uh, these are carefully thought out sometimes that are ongoing for for years and and I don't know maybe uh, I just don't get it um, all right let me see uh, I've forgotten about the last two verses uh, I forgot how far we are on that I read those two didn't I Renee yes yes Okay, uh, I don't remember your comment on it now. Were you talking about the last two verses? Yeah, you... yeah, I was saying, you know, uh, he's saying their focus is on earthly things, but our focus oh, yeah. is yeah. on heavenly things. Yes. Okay, uh, let me, uh, I'll read it in the Amplified, but I really love this, uh, the way it is in the KJV. It says, for our conversation is in heaven. Um well, that's we should be focused on heaven. I, we, I did this series, uh, the playlist called, entitled simply Heaven. And all we did in the study was uh, take Randy Alcorn's book, which is a large um, book that's probably 400 pages, 500 pages long. And it's, a, it's a, the most thorough book and study on the subject of heaven I've ever found. In fact, it, it's hard to find any books on heaven. It's, nobody talks about it or writes about it or preaches on it. But we went through that book, a group of us read it together and discussed it. And it's 50 hours long is the conversation uh, discussing heaven. And one of the things that said very early in the book is that you know, there's a saying that most people are so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. I'm sure many people have heard that saying. Uh, they're all just thinking about heaven and they're not busy doing anything in ministry to, to serve uh, now. Uh, but really, the, 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 the truth of the matter is it's, it's more likely the, the opposite, that a lot of people are very busy, uh, you know, in their ministry and sometimes being legalistic and trying to be religious, and yet they don't think at all about what's promised and what's waiting for us. And uh, very few people could even talk about heaven for more than 60 seconds. Think about it. Could you talk about heaven very long? What do you know about heaven? What could you tell people about heaven? Uh, could you talk 10 minutes or an hour, 50 hours? You know, there's a, there's a really a lot uh, more than you realize. And it's, it's one of the, it's the most wonderful subject. I remember when we did that study, I remember I was so happy. It took us probably a month or, or more to complete that study together and I was so happy and it and, and this is what I'm thinking of here is that for our conversation is in heaven if you think about what is waiting for you um, uh, it's a, such a joyful thing you'll always be in a joyful state of mind if you're thinking about wow this is what the Lord has promised me 
and it's it's a, it, one verse that uh, it could should give us the right perspective of it is it says that uh, no uh, eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived or imagined the good things God has prepared for those who love Him. So the 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 beauty and joy of of, of heaven for us in eternity is beyond anything we could even imagine. Um, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have Jesus is called the Savior and the Lord. The Lord, I imagine that's probably kurios, which means Lord in the sense of its deity. So he's our Savior, God, Jesus. And then verse 21, who shall change our vile body? Lord, oh boy, I can't wait. Oh man, I wish it was changed. I wish my body was changed now. I'm not feeling good. Uh, I have, I've had all kinds of problems with health and getting older is, and uh, falling apart is not easy. I want that changed body. This who shall change our vile body. Yeah, I'm, I can identify. I feel like my body is vile. It's, in, it's getting old and falling apart. And it's, it's, an, it's inescapable. No matter what you do. You could study and try to do everything right to keep be healthy and, and, and live as long as you can, but you, you're only possibly postponing it and delaying it. Eventually, it's going to fall apart. And that, But it says that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So this is telling us that our resurrected bodies, that the Lord promises us a bodily resurrection to, that has eternal life. And it's going to be like Jesus's resurrected body. He is the prototype. I mean, I, I know many of you, probably most of you know this, but we know that there's people who are new to either the faith or maybe you're just checking out this channel and uh, you'd be surprised how many people uh, they, they either think of themselves as Christians, like Roman Catholics. If you ask a Roman Catholic um, about the resurrection, they don't know what you're talking about. Every time I like Oh, I won't mention names, but I have family and friends that are Roman Catholics. That I, but when I talk about a resurrection, they don't even know what it, I mean. They don't have any clue that at some point we're going to all get resurrected and that we're going to have eternal glorified physical bodies living on the earth, not up in some other dimension or non-physical non existence. They don't know that. So uh, it, even though you may know it, but there's people who are not aware of that. And this is this is exciting to me that, that we are promised a body that is like the Lord's resurrected body that's perfect. We'll never get old, never get sick, never die. There'll be no more tears, nothing but joy. And, and it says, according to the working whereby he is able to even subdue all things unto himself. Uh, well, I don't know how to subdue all things unto himself. Maybe you can tell me more about that, Renee our earthly bodies so that they will be like his glorious resurrected body, it says in, in uh, the Amplified. Uh, but that's, uh, that's exciting to me. I mean, especially, I mean, if you have, uh, if, you've, if you're sick, if you have any issues with, with your body or you're getting old, uh, this is a promise that should make you very, very happy. Yeah. Uh... I want to remind the viewers that you had a playlist over a hundred hours long. That's still up. And I also have a live stream on what heaven's like about two hours. Um, so you can go to both of our channels and you want to know a little more about what the Bible says about heaven. He's got an extensive study on it. And I just, you know, we just have a conversation on it, but uh, lots of information there. And it's just amazing to think about. But our minds can't even uh, have any idea. Well, we don't have anything to compare it to, you know. And as far as he'll subdue all things to himself, I, I think that is just uh, talking about God's promises and God's power uh, to give us these promises of a glorified body. And uh, to me, this is just a comparison of how they mind earthly things and the things of their body like circumcision. But Jesus, the promise is he's going to change this wild body. So you putting a mark or cutting your uh, dead flesh, dead body, uh, it, it, it 
in the long run, it, it serves nothing because our mind is on heavenly things and he will change our vile body uh, to be changed like under his glorious body. Uh, that's why it says, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That's why it says, according to the working whereby. So I think it has to do with our resurrection and the, and the promise and why we can believe it, it will occur. So, I mean, that's what I think. However, I looked, when you said that, I looked up to see, again, the sin consciousness of commentary writers. This guy goes to this, which I don't see it in scripture at all. It's true, but I don't see that here. He put, there may be sins within your heart that have long resisted control, but Jesus can subdue all things. If you will just hand the conflict over to Jesus, he will subdue them. He will bring them under his strong subjecting hand. What he can, what you cannot do, he can. Okay, but that's true, but I don't see that being in the context of this. But I did want to read it because I found it after you asked about it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I, let's, so we still have time left, so let's move on to chapter 4, verse 1. Let me see, uh, Renee, uh, could you read verse 1 for me? Sure. Uh, let me. Okay, as we like to remind all the time, a chapter division does not necessarily mean a new thought. It is often a continuation of the prior thought, and this is a perfect example. Therefore, is the beginning of the first chapter. Therefore, meaning it's continuing the thought. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. What a bunch of terms of endearment. He uses there for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That uh, it, I, I imagine that uh, whoever it was, um, I did look this up. Uh, it, it's easy to look up. You could just ask Google uh, when and who divided the Bible into chapters. It, it happened about a thousand years ago, uh, and about five or 600 years ago is when they divided it into verses, numbered the verses, I should say. Uh, but um, uh, whoever divided it into chapters, um, uh, this, uh, therefore, it, it seemed like an obvious place maybe to make a chapter division because now he's moving on to, okay, now I'll start summing things up. I'll, I'm going to make a conclusion based upon what I said earlier. That's what therefore means is that you have to keep in mind what was, has just been said. Uh, you have to keep the context. So he says, my brethren, he's, obviously he's talking to believers. We know that. Dearly beloved and longed for. Uh, so that's a wonderful, affectionate uh, way of, of addressing them. My joy and crown. So uh, I think he's referring to the brethren as how he is, sees them as his joy He's joyful about them, and 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 he considers them his crown. In that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't remember if you get a uh, yeah. You have a crown as an evangelist, right, Renee? One of the five crowns is evangelism. Um, so when yeah, but I, I think this is a reference like to the Olympians. They would get uh, the little crown at the end when they won the race. Mm -hmm. You know, not a royalty crown. As it says. Yeah. Well, is, a, is the crown and the joy of for evangelism? Uh, yes. For soul it referring, it's referring to the, the brethren, though. Yes, right? it is. It's referring to the Philippians. Uh, so steadfast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Uh, so it, it's just a wonderful uh, way. I wish if someone said that to me or about me, it surely would make me feel wonderful that anybody thought that that way of me. So, uh, okay, go ahead, Renee. I don't have any more to say on yeah, that. Yeah, the, the main thing is he really is letting him, he's showering them with, in terms of endearment for his love. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, like he, he's desiring once again uh, to let them know how he wants to be in their presence. My joy and crown, like they are his prize. And I think if we go back before, uh, prior, you know, 
uh, the prize of the high calling of God, not the prize of salvation. It's not a prize. You can't win mm -hmm. salvation or earn salvation, but the prize of the high calling and to save souls and uh, to lead this church is his calling. So my joy and my crown. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Uh, he, he calls him dearly beloved twice. Uh, his joy and crown, he longs uh, for them. So uh, everything he said prior was to motivate them to remain steadfast in Christ, focused on the power of the resurrection, his promises, our heavenly citizenship, to remain with that mindset. Uh, to focus on those things um, and that yeah. that's where he wants the church as a whole to remain. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, verse two. Why don't you read two and three back to me? Cause there, there's not much really in two. Sorry, I had to calm it down in here. The dog just came back in, so it was a little bit loud. Okay, so uh, I'm reading verses two and three. Yes. Yeah. Am I commenting on them first or no? No, read it to me. Uh, okay. no, no, actually, uh, let me see. Uh, I'm sorry. I read this to you, don't I? Because you, you, I'm okay. sorry. I got confused. I'm going to read two and three, and you comment. Okay. okay? Uh, I beseech you, odious and beseech Synthicus, <laughs> Syntyche, I don't know how to say that, uh, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Okay, so uh, yoke fellow, that just means we're both under the yoke of service, right? Uh, these are two women. So he's asking that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Apparently there's a disagreement. That's why he's beseeching them that they be of the same mind in the Lord. So these are two saved women, fellow workers, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. Hard to do when you got to be silent, by the way. With Clement also, and with my other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So everyone, here, okay, for this is a great one because their names are in the book of life, okay? that they know where they're going. Uh, so many people try to say Paul was unsure. It's silly, because but they twist those verses like the one in the prior chapter. But he knew where these people were going as well. So it sounds like they these two women had some falling out, some disagreement with one another, and he wants them to reconcile with each other. Is it? He wants them and everyone to be in of the same mind in the Lord. So I, I don't know what the issue was, but they're in some kind of disagreement over something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, the, um, yeah, it's, it's clear that he's uh, somehow now it was, I think the letter was broadly to the church, uh, but now he's zeroing in on a couple of individuals. Obviously, someone made him aware of a problem in the church. And so he people send him letters or they travel and, and they tell him what's happening in the church. And now that he's become aware, he's saying in the end, just making a note, he's not making a big deal of it, but he's just going to make sure he includes that in, as he's closing here, that... Uh, uh, hey, uh, come on, you guys, work together. And indeed, ask you, I'm going to read in the Amplified. I urge Yodia and urge Sintik to agree and to work in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, I ask you too, my true companion, to help these women. However, I, uh, Renee, 
I don't know who this is addressed to, this true companion. Uh, I went back while you were talking, I looked at the first chapter thinking, did he address this letter to an individual and I forgot? I, I, uh, who is this true companion that he's, he's referring to in verse three? Uh, to help these women to keep on cooperating, for they have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Uh, it's just not clear, uh, specified that I can see who this other person is in verse three he's referring to. Do you have any idea? Uh, maybe uh, Timothy that came that was coming to them soon. Remember, there was gonna was it Timothy or Titus that was coming there? Yeah. He mentions them earlier in the letter. That, yeah. and then he had also was going to send back the other guy that was sick nigh unto death. What was his name? It might have been him. Yeah, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, let me, uh, uh, verse 4 and 5. Uh, let, go ahead and read 4 and 5, and I'll, I'll try to comment on that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's hard when we, we don't have the actually what happened. We have to kind of surmise the situation. Oh, maybe uh, there's a footnote. Let me look just to see. Maybe there's a footnote that explains it, uh, verse 3 and 4 here. Okay, here it's four and five, right? It says Yodia and Sintik, who two otherwise unknown women in the Philippian congregation, on the advice to them, uh, on yoke mate in verse three, it says, or comrade, although the Greek Sisigus could also be a proper name. Eusebius. Yeah. So maybe yeah, the, 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 the footnote thinks that this uh that one, we don't know who it was. It is referring to Sisygus. Um, Clement, otherwise unknown, although later writers sought to identify him with Clement, Bishop of Rome. Uh, Eusebius uh, said that in his book, Ecclesiastical History. Yeah, but Clement was a popular name. They don't know if it was the same Clement. Yeah. In, in Philippi. Yeah, that doesn't make sense, does it? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I looked that up. I looked yeah. that up, and it says, although people try to say this is Clement of the popular Clement, Clement's a popular name, and since they're in Philippi, I don't think it's the same Clement. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's uh, go ahead and read verse four and five, and I'll try to explain it. All right, uh, let's see. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Hmm, the Lord is at hand. Well, obviously, I keep on re reminding everybody that um, I've been doing a lot more studying on Revelation and eschatology again. And when I see things like the Lord is at hand or something's at hand or, or things are about to happen, and, you know, I, uh, I, I think that a lot of these things are referencing the idea that they're expecting the Lord very soon. Uh, they expect a lot of these prophecies and stuff to happen right away. And so uh, uh, there, there's, but, uh, and of course we know that uh, there's that verse in, in uh, Peter that uh, says that uh, the Lord is not slack in his promise, uh, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, no, the Lord is not slack in his promises. Some men count slackness. In other, in other words, people are saying, hey, he hasn't returned. Where, what, is he coming back? Is this, can we even believe this? Uh, there are a lot of people who were, were challenging the, the faith because the Lord hadn't returned. They, they, they were expecting an imminent return. And that's why I think when it says the Lord is at hand here, let your moderation be known unto all men. Uh, let me look at that in the Amplified, verse 5, and see what, how it says that. Uh, let your gentle spirit, your graciousness, unselfishness, mercy, tolerance, and patience be known to all people. Well, that's a very good exhortation. I guess that's an exhortation that we could give each other right now. That uh, let, let, that's, the, that's the attitude that we want to uh, give off. To, to all people. We want to be known by that. 
We want people yeah, to think of us in that way. Yes. I don't see let your I'm always right dogmatism be the thing that everybody should know about you first. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I don't see that anywhere, actually. Not just here in this, but it, I, I don't think I've seen any verses uh, saying that, have I? Yeah. For the sake of of non-offense, it's all you never fail trying to comfort and be kind. It doesn't mean that you unite in error, but there is a way to have discussions without being offensive to people. Mm -hmm. Did you want you want to continue? I'm sorry, I, I had to make that. No, I was, I was finished. Uh, oh. well, I, I, well, if we're putting all this together, Brother Luke, I'm thinking that for so he's mentioning his love for them, right? All these mushy terms of endearment. Then he mentions, hey, we got two ladies here that are true women of God that are at odds with one another right now. And then he asked the rest of the church and some specific leaders here to help them come to like mind again, reconcile them. And I think he's saying, in spite of this, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. We can all rejoice. We can always find a reason to be in joy because God's promises are so secure. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. So yeah, keep your mind up above. If you're focusing on him and you're in joy with his promises, it's a lot easier to reconcile with one another and to come together in unity. I, I think that's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me read uh, verse 6. I'll just stop at verse 6 for you. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Ray? Well, uh, be careful for now. I think that means don't worry. Don't worry about anything. Let me see. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made uh, known to God. Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. Uh, he also told us, don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, where you're going to live, what kind of clothes you're going to wear. He said, give it all to God. God takes care of his own kids, right? That he'll provide your daily bread, your daily needs, your spiritual bread and your physical bread. He said, God knows you need these things. So I think the being careful for nothing here is don't worry. Don't get into worry, but rely on your father. And that we should always go with Thanksgiving because we always have something to be grateful for, especially the joy we have because of the promises, which is sad because most people deny those promises, deny our blessed assurance. How can you come to God with joy and and gratitude if you're not sure you have something or if you got to work to keep it? How are you grateful for it if it's you doing something to get it or keep it, right? So it's very, very sad that that's the attitude today. Like it's some kind of thing they've got to warn us. You can lose it. But don't you know you can lose it? It's really sad. It's tearing people to pieces, destroying their faith. It's the opposite here by Paul. Stand fast. Stand fast. Remain. Trust. Focus on it. It's always, uh, it's never question uh, God. It's always to thank him and to know he's got you. And it's the same thing here. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It says be careful, but um, if I told someone be be very very careful because there's a slippery spot up there, uh, well, that means hey, uh, I'm I'm worried worried that you might fall, and to be so you got to be careful. So, I, the idea of of being careful uh, and uh, hey. The idea is we're worried. You must. You need to be careful. Uh, well, and that's the way it's uh, translated in the Amplified. Uh, the way you uh, did it, Renee. It says, "Do not be anxious or worry about anything, but in everything, er every circumstance and situation, by prayer and petition 
with thanksgiving. Continue to make your specific requests known to God. So I don't know about you, Renee, and everybody else, but uh, this has always been a hard thing for me to do, is to not worry. Uh, I remember uh, remember Brother Cripps, uh, uh, he he um, did a teaching once on, he, I think he called it the folds of faith. But he was, he said that it was very hard for him to, to, uh, to have faith that the Lord would provide everything and for him. Uh, having faith that the Lord will give him eternal life. Okay. That's, that's fine. I, I believe that. And I, I don't have any doubt. That's settled. Okay. I'm confident of that. But now when it comes to, you know, um, not worrying the way Jesus, don't worry about anything. I mean, uh, I, to me, that's one of the most beautiful portions of scripture when Jesus talks about the, 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 the flowers and the, uh, it just really should put our mind at ease, but it's never really gotten rid of my worries. My, my, my worry is not really about myself at all. My worry is always about uh, my family and loved ones. I'm I'm always worrying about them. I'm always worried something they get sick or there's going to be an accident or something's going to happen. And, and that worry is the opposite of faith. It, if you have faith, you're not worrying. If you're worrying, you don't have faith. So um, I, I don't know. I don't know what I can do. I guess I, mean, I, I could pray that I not to worry, but uh, I don't know if anybody else struggles with it or not. But that's what this is telling us here in this these verses. Uh, don't worry. Brother uh, Luke. Yeah. Uh, ben wrote something good in the chat room. The true companion is actually the whole Philippian church. He's speaking to them as a single unit. And he, he posts, now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. So true companion is probably referring to the Philippians as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would very well may be the case. Um, let me see. Okay, it's getting close to, to finish time now. So let me see. That was, what was the last verse we did? Uh, uh, verse six. So, so we got seven through 23. Well, I guess we can uh, take our time with the remaining verses next time. Finish, we'll be finished up with Philippians. This is the last chapter, isn't it? Yeah, so we go to Colossians next. Uh, okay, Renee, let, let's give us uh, give our um, uh, closing remarks, your summary thoughts on the, the, the talk tonight. Yeah, uh, well, although we didn't get a ton of verses, uh, I'm I'm glad we went over what we did because it is a, a perfect example. Like when we went through the commentary, yes, these verses could mean that in the correct context, but with the context we see, they're just putting their own ideas of what an enemy of the cross would look like. They're assuming an enemy of the cross is somebody who lives essentially and uh, lives a bad Christian life and gives the church a bad name. Well, that's true. But the warning here is about the circumcision legalists and how we don't have our own righteousness which is of the law and we don't mind things of the flesh like circumcision but mind heavenly things so to go from that to that makes no sense at all so i'm glad we actually saw how common this is and and, and i'm surprised because this one commentary is the one i've been pulling up sometimes you know whenever we ask a question i'll go huh i don't know let me get a look and I, they do it too. It's why I, I try not to read them first, you know, try not to read them first because they, they tend to put ideas in and then you're blind to what the context actually says. So I, I'm, I'm glad we went over that because I think it's important to remain in the thought that was meant 
when the letter was written. Um, so although Paul does talk about walking in the power of the resurrection, I think that's the, the point. It's the power of the resurrection, not the power of the law that we walk by, you know, that gives us maturity. Uh, and the constant uh, reminders that things went on back then. We all go about, oh, I wish I'd lived during that. Oh, my gosh. People think that the church didn't have problems that everybody sang kumbaya and everything. There was all kinds of carnality and arguments and false teachings and Gnosticism and everything else that had to be knocked down constantly. Uh, so there were plenty of problems, even in the, the time of the apostles and the, all the apostles warned, hey, once I'm gone, grievous wolves are going to come in, not sparing the flock, going to give in to all. Look at what the Catholic Church, how far they've gone from the truth. And it's true. And all these denominations, they're, they've all gone away from the simplicity in Christ. So few, you know, and uh, so it's interesting to go back and see the little problems that were going on and, and risen up in the church is fascinating. You know, it's nothing, nothing changes. I mean, it really is the same issues that we had and I really enjoyed it. I, I missed Ben, um, uh, but I was glad to see his comment there. That makes complete sense. True companion, the church as a whole. Very, very, and it makes sense too. Because he points out some certain people, but then asked everybody to help everybody come to a like mind. So that certainly, certainly makes sense. And we should all rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. That is one command that should not be hard. But surprisingly, it is for some Christians. We're so focused on our problems. We don't take time to look at the glorious future we all have been promised by Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Well, we, uh, we, I think we got uh, through 10 verses tonight. I think we got 16 verses remaining in this book. So I expect next Wednesday we'll finish the study on Philippians and move on to Colossians uh, the following week. Uh, there wasn't really much uh, doctrinal uh, stuff in the subject tonight. Um, I'm, I hope I made sense because I'm, my energy's low, but I, I think I, I hope I communicate. Okay. I made it through. So I'm happy about that. Uh, but, uh, so this is Wednesday, uh, Renee, uh, do you have a Thursday program planned? No, not till the 25th. Okay, all right. I keep forgetting, but I'll keep asking. Uh, all right, so the next time uh, we'll all get together uh, Friday night, the same channel, 9.30 Eastern Time. Thank you, everybody, for participating, uh, especially if you're here just visiting. Uh, I hope you're blessed, and I invite you to join us uh, every Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. <laughs>